Okay. I was just answering our first question, so. All right. Well, we still have a few minutes. I know we've got people kind of registering now. They're signing in. Maybe we'll give it a minute. <laughs> we're live. We are. I think we're live. We hope everyone's doing well. Brian, why don't you jump in there and join to your sure. and talk about where we are? We're all set. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. This is our, our third webinar in our series. If you'd like to check out our other webinars, you can find those at www.esimpro.com, which is at the bottom of the screen, forward slash webinar. And I can send that out to all of our participants today via uh, the chat function. So I can send that out. That is also where you'll find your CE certificate this morning or this afternoon. And that'll also be on that website and I'll send that out to all participants and you can print that out there for, for CEs. Um, my name is, is Brian Connors. I'm the president of eSIM. We provide motivational interviewing training online. So as far as the technical part of this today, if you have any questions technically about um, uh, CEUs, um, anything like that, I'll be answering them throughout the, the session. If you have any questions about the content, uh, anything like that, what we're going to do is you can ask them all throughout the presentation and we'll address them at the end. Okay, so feel free to ask at any time, but we'll just hold the Q&A until the end so we can just flow through this. Expect the presentation to be about an hour is, is what we're looking at, 45 minutes for the presentation and then we'll do a Q&A for 10, 15 minutes or so. So that's, that's the format. So I'll let our presenters introduce themselves starting with, um, with Chase and uh, let you guys go from there. Excellent. Hey, welcome everyone. Today we're gonna talk a little bit about this idea of how to respond to addiction using motivational interview, interviewing and acceptance commitment therapy. So uh, this will be our agenda. Oh, we just had our first technical difficulties. Um, okay, so our agenda will be, oh, hey everyone, hang tight. We just locked up there, okay. So we'll do quick introductions. Uh, it's gonna be pretty brief on motivational interviewing. We have some other kind of material that kind of reviews MI. So if you're looking for more of that, uh, eSimpro.com has quite a bit of information there, plus some of our other slides. Today, we're really going to be focusing on acceptance commitment therapy with Chase, who's one of our resident experts in this area. Uh, as far as who I am, Brad Lundahl, I'm a faculty member in the University of Utah, and I work with eSim as the content officer, a PhD in clinical psychology. So that's me. I'm going to spend a little time there. If you want to know more, you can check us out on eSim. Chase, turn over to you. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here, everybody. I, this is a topic that I am both personally and professionally really passionate about, and uh, it's just a joy for me to be here. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So yeah, I, uh, I have a master's degree in social work from the University of Utah uh, that I got a few years ago. I am a person in long-term recovery from active addiction. Um, that, that's where my passion from, for this subject comes from. I mean, I've, I've had just kind of a unique perspective as both a client uh, in treatment multiple times for, for substance dependence. And uh, now I'm a professional. So I just I kind of have this dual perspective that's just kind of unique. So um, my experience is I have a little over 10 years in the addiction recovery field. I've worked in inpatient, uh, partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, um, pretty much any setting you can think of for addiction. And uh, I also provide trainings like you guys for both motivational interviewing and acceptance and commitment therapy. And I supervise and train uh, other therapists in those things. Uh, I own a little, a little shop called Kaizen Center for Mental Health where we, we specialize in a few different things. I, my, my, me, myself, personally, I work with addictions and anxiety. I use those modalities, ACT, MI, mind-body bridging. But my therapist, uh, work with a variety of populations outside of that. So that's me. Yeah. 
Chase is one of my favorite guys. He was a student of mine probably seven years ago. Very eager, very honest, authentic, and I think has really been a student of how do we deliver better services to the people with whom we work. And so, you know, we've been friends for a number of years, worked together. So uh, I think it's, we have a lot to learn. So I'm excited to talk about this. We've co-lectured several times up at the university. Okay, so <clears throat> just kind of backing up here. So talking about blending treatments. So, and there may be some disagreement in the MI community about this. This is my way of thinking about it. So how do we blend? So it, to my view, it's almost like a bricks and mortar approach that motivational interviewing, while a, if you will, a brick itself or an act of treatment in its own right, I also see it as a mortar that connects the bricks, that there's a lot of different modalities we use to help people move forward, to help them develop you know, skills and tools to be successful. And motivational interviewing is used constantly. So I begin with motivational interviewing, I end with motivational interviewing, and then it weaves throughout the session. So it's really a blending or a braided approach. And today we'll be talking about acts. Do you want to, any comments there, Chase? Yeah, I, I think the, the philosophy that MI holds, uh, <laughs> respecting, you know, what the client has to say and uh, what their autonomy is and where they want to, you know, steer their life. Right. Act overlays very, very nicely. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can't wait to, to jump in. All right, so we'll talk about the blend here. Uh, quickly, evidence for, you know, acceptance commitment theory, acceptance commitment therapy and motivational interviewing. So there is evidence. There's quite a lot of evidence. Uh, we won't be spending a lot of time on that, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption to say that both these approaches can have a significant and helpful impact on uh, you know, in helping people overcome addiction, moving toward recovery. Uh, certainly there's some variance there, but there is there is an evidence base. Addiction's impact. Uh, Chase, you've seen that. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on the impact addiction can have on individuals, families, and society? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, like I, like I said, I've, I've been to treatment a few times and, and I have the perspective of a client of, of how hard it is to step out of active addiction. Um, and, you know, I, I just think about how our, if we could pick a, a time to live right now with access to, to medicine or clean water or, you know, food globally, we, we couldn't have picked a better time for things like that. And yet addiction overdoses are going up, anxiety rates are up, depression is up, we're going in the wrong direction in a lot of really important measures in mental health and addiction is one of the ugliest representations of, of that direction. And, um, yeah, I, you know, just happened to make a phone call to a family member of a, of a loved one that's, um, passed away from addiction. I, I don't wish for anyone. And, uh, I've, you know, been very, very close to that in my work and it's very unfortunate. It's really sad. It is sad. And um, our guess is most of the people who are listening have had a pretty close touch with addiction. And so it really is, it can just wreck someone's life and someone's family. And the good news is that there is hope and we'll talk about how to help people move forward. So uh, skipping forward, let me just share with you real quick, if you will, MI's approach to addiction. And this is truncated, right? There's, there's a larger uh, kind of conceptual and, and empirical base here, but we'll just kind of give a quick look. So MI says that motivation matters. So let's do a little word game here. If there's a blank, then there's a blank. What might that be? If there's a, you want to guess? Uh, will? You got it. Okay. If there's a will, then there's a way. So MI really emphasizes the idea of the, the importance of uh, motivation. And if people have a sufficient amount of motivation, they will work hard to figure out you know, how to overcome addiction. So MI focuses a little bit more here in this range, the, the, the will or the motivation, and ACT can give us some tools or skills on the way. Um, another one, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make a drink. Again, if, for those of us who have worked with individuals that are struggling with addiction, you know that's such a true story, right? Like all the resources in the world, but people sometimes just don't kind of pick it up. So MI really is a strategy about how to, you know, help people identify and commit to their own motivation for health. Um, and that's not what we're going to focus today. Uh, MI has four processes, you know, promoting engagement, 
you know, getting to focus or agreed upon goals, you know, lifting and encouraging and, and you know, evoking the person's motivation, and then eventually helping them develop a credible plan or the how. So um, it, we might think about this from an ingredients to change. So if we think about like when someone's successful, what's going on? What are some of those ingredients? One is there's a vision that someone says, you know, that's where I want to get. That's what I want to accomplish. Their motivation toward that goal is really critical. Other people can supply motivation. Like I might say, hey, Chase, I'd really like you, know, you to do these things. Like I want you to run an ultra marathon next year. But if you have zero motivation for that, there'll be probably zero action on it. And then confidence is critical. Resources, time, energy, money, skills, tools, you know, individual support systems. That's all critical. And then knowledge and skill. And this is where we're going to jump into act at the moment that, you know, if you think about driving a car, I might know, you know, what I want. I might be motivated. I might be really, you know, have some confidence. Like I can drive that car and get to where I want to go. But if I don't have, you know, either resources, a car and or knowledge or skill of how to be successful, then we kind of, we don't get as far, right? So it's all these ingredients are pretty important. And today we're going to talk about act. Sound good? Sweet. All right. So I'm going to change over to your slideshow here. Give me one second and we'll turn it over to Chase. Yeah. And I, my mind goes to, as you're talking about a lack of knowledge or skill, um, that's why the recidivism rates with addiction are just so bad. I mean, the, the recidivism rates have been as bad as they've been for a long time. I mean, and I, I don't see them moving in any kind of meaningful way until we have kind of the latest um, science and, and theory with, with stuff like MI and ACT. And in my experience, something like ACT is just fundamentally different from a lot of other approaches that I'm familiar with as both a client and, and a therapist. So I can't wait to jump in. So let's see, the assumption here that, that ACT takes is that suffering is both ubiquitous and normal. Um, and that's, that's kind of a dark assumption that that's not a happy idea to think about. Yeah. Um, and if we can kind of make room for that assumption, it, it may allow for like a little bit of freedom to respond to suffering differently. You know, there, there's this, I, I, I remember, you know, vividly re reading this for the first time in get out of your mind and into your life. And it said throughout our lifetime, we have a 50, 50 chance of struggling with suicidal thoughts at a moderate to a severe level for at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. And Brad, like I, I reread that a few times because I was like, wait, what? I had no idea that suffering was that common. Yep. The good news is ACT offers an approach to suffering. Other kind of traditions do as well and, and ACT borrows from that. But I think one of the great ideas is like when we think about suffering, if you don't know how to approach that, then that just contributes to the pain or the anxiety. Like not only am I suffering, I don't know how to kind of deal with that, that might lower our hopes. If we can develop a credible plan for how to respond to suffering that can move us forward. And I think ACT is one of my favorite approaches because it, it gives us some tools and skills there. Sweet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it is abnormal not to experience significant psychological struggles. Um, so how do we respond to suffering? That's a fair question. And if you were to ask most people, like how do you respond to you know, a challenge of like a budget or how do you respond to getting a job? People would probably be able to kind of, you know, spell out a few steps. But what about suffering? Like, and I act, I, I know, I think it has a lot to do with almost the serenity prayer, you know, this idea of seeing there's some things we can change, some things we can't, working hard on the things that we can change and control, knowing the difference and then working on acceptance. That's that I'm dumbing that down a lot, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. It's great. The, the wisdom to know the difference, the wisdom part specifically, in my perspective, is where psychological flexibility shows up, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about in a second. But it's, it's hard to know what you can accept and what you need to change. And until we have some more skills on board, we'll probably just keep repeating the same thing. And that's, in my experience, why I went to treatment multiple times. Hmm. So... So some of our responses to suffering are harmful and context really, really matters. I thought about putting a picture right here of two guys in a zebra suit at a, at a, at a game reserve because context really matters, but I couldn't find a picture. So what do we do? We, we run away from painful emotions. I'm feeling a little bit anxious right now, Brad. Yeah. My heart's beating a little bit. I can feel 
Uh, anyone who knows me, I've got just like a little bit of sweaty armpits and I, anxiety is uncomfortable. No one wants to feel it. So we run from it. And um, our society has gotten really good at finding better and better ways to make pain go away. I mean, we have this cell phone that constantly is available to us to scroll through to escape and avoid our experience. I could, I could talk the rest of the, the hour about ways that we can avoid that. So the, the example I have here is, you know, sometimes that escape or avoiding pain is useful. Right. You know, I, I hope I never have to have a filling without Novocaine, uh, but it's, it's great because that, that Novocaine temporarily blocks the pain of getting a cavity filled. And in a DUI, it's also blocking your experience, but it's while you're behind the, the, the wheel of a vehicle. So context just really, really matters. Avoidance in itself is not bad. It's just what are we avoiding and when are we avoiding it? So a healthy approach. So if, if we can work with our, the people with whom we work and help them understand that you know, suffering is going to happen, that's again, ubiquitous. And then let's kind of develop a strategy for helping you to respond to in a healthy versus an unhealthy or helpful versus unhelpful way. Yeah, good. And some compassion that it's just normal to try to want to run away from painful experience and, and that, it's, that it's, it's almost just okay that everything that we've tried up to this point hasn't worked. Not because you haven't tried hard enough or you're not smart enough or skilled enough, just because it's not going to work. Yep. Um, so the other way that we respond to suffering is we just lose contact with the present moment. And, you know, I don't know about you, Brad, but I don't drive as much lately, but regularly, if I'm uh, mindful enough, I'll see people on their cell phones while they're driving. And I don't know what the stats are, but that likely has a higher mortality rate than sure. a lot of other behaviors. Um, so being able to contact the present moment when we're suffering is just a fundamental skill that, that has kind of liberated me from some of my own personal struggles and that I watch uh, really help other people. But it doesn't seem intuitive on some level. That's maybe where the motivation comes in. This idea of like leaning into the struggle, leaning into the suffering. Uh, we want to pull back and withdraw, but really the idea is to lean into it. Is that yeah. accurate or how would you say it? Yeah. Like if the analogy of a dog biting a hand, you know, the, 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 the urge would be to withdraw your hand from the dog's mouth and the, the teeth actually dig in, you know, how to make a dog let go. No you force your hand down its throat and it gags and it lets go. Another analogy that's kind of, that's kind of a weird one is a Chinese finger trap. If you force your ends and ends of your fingers into a Chinese finger trap, you try to withdraw them, you're stuck. But if you go back in, there's room to move. Right. So uh, how do we get started talking about this? I'm not sure. Remind me. Yeah. We're just talking about the motivation, like this idea of losing contact with the present moment. And sometimes that means like if there's suffering, we might want to step back. And, and it's not talking. intuitive to lean into the right. suffering. Right. So that's kind of some of these analogies that, that don't really make sense. They're, they're paradoxical, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, being able to contact the present moment, even when you're suffering is not intuitive. Right. Okay. What else we got? Uh, and the longer we've been running from our experiences our, our painful emotions or doing things that violate our own values, I, I know my experience was that I started to have a lot of shame about those behaviors. And then we start to defend uh, those behaviors with, with stories and we can get caught up in uh, that. I am not an alcoholic or I am an alcoholic. I mean, I, I've witnessed so much energy in treatment world uh, for addiction where people spend so much energy debating whether or not they're an alcoholic. And meanwhile, they're not living their life. Right. Um, so that's another, catch is not only to come to the present moment, but just to be aware that your mind is constantly generating thoughts and stories. And we do not have to attend to them if it's not useful, which, yeah. which brings me to my next point. Um, on this last slide is, is this idea of functional versus literal truth. And um, the last time I was in treatment as a client, I, uh, I had this story rolling around my head that eventually my, my difficulties would increase and I would relapse and end up back in treatment. And that had happened multiple times. And it seemed so true. It yeah. seemed literally true that it was likely that I was going to relapse. Functionally, that story, when it really dominated my awareness, didn't help me live a better right. life. So that was, ACT was one of the, the first times I kind of 
became aware that I was thinking and I had a story. And then I made enough space from it to, to evaluate, is that useful? Yeah, I love it. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. One way I try to talk about this is this, I was trying to do a backflip once, my first backflip ball <laughs> skiing. I've never heard this. And so I'm on the ramp, you know, there's gravity's taken over. There's no undoing it. Like yeah. Gravity is now in charge. Okay. And the thought comes to my head, oh no, this may not work. True or false? It's true. <laughs> I might crash. Yeah. Is that a helpful thought? Yes. No, it's not. not, 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 not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> like if you're going to throw it, you got to throw it. Yeah. And so, or send it. The, the, the kids say send it these days. Send it. Yeah, send it. So that's an example of it. It's, it's true, but it's just not helpful. So I think what ACT does is help us to kind of step back and say, what's the utility or functioning of these thoughts? Yes. And, and so that's a little bit where it diverges a little bit from cognitive therapy, which is like, is this thought true or not true? ACT talks about the impact or the functionality, the helpful or unhelpfulness of the thought. Amen. Well said. So given all that, the, the question that I start out with when, when I'm working with clients as a therapist, or if you're in some other profession, you're a nurse or you're a doctor or you're a coach, or you only have five minutes or 60 minutes, this, this assumption can be useful for, for tons of different populations. I mean, I remember some of your slides about MI, that MI can go in so many different directions as far as research goes, anywhere from you know, safe water practices to addiction to, and I, the, the, the familiarity I have with ACT is, is very similar, that, that there's tons of applications. So no matter where you're at with helping people, starting with this question of, is your thoughts or feelings or your behaviors moving you toward or away from a life worth living is just, um, for me, uh, a really useful question to start out with. Excellent. And, you know, uh, the more that we can see that our struggle takes us away from that life and that we're struggling with something that is unavoidable, we're trying to make something go away that will never go away. For example, don't think about a pink elephant. You probably just thought about a pink elephant. If you tell yourself don't have anxiety, the more you don't want it, the more you've got it. Okay, so that inflexibility leads to less living because your life is now about managing anxiety or managing an, an addiction, you know, with, with my own experience. Um, and that leads to less living. And, you know, there's tons of examples. I like that. I think on some level, this idea that if you over identify, if you have a thought and you over identify with it, like if you're fused to your thought, meaning not flexible, then you're functionally a slave to that thought, that that thought becomes your slave master and it, it directs you. So, Part of the idea is really developing some space between stimulus, the thought, and your response. So if you have some space there, you could be more intentional in kind of shaping your life and your behaviors. So yes, yes. And, and I hope that before we're done here, I can give a few examples of what those kind of just micro skills are just quickly to, to see and, and demonstrate some of that. So, so ACT's whole goal is to develop this skill called psychological flexibility. Mm. There's, there's three big parts of it, and it's the ability to show up in the present moment, even when it's scary, even when it, especially when it's scary, or especially when it's painful. Uh, for example, public speaking. I mean, every time I public speak, Brad, I have <laughs> more anxiety, and I, I'm willing to show up to that anxiety because I really care about what, what I'm talking about today. Nice. But it's a skill. I mean, my urge is to run away, yeah. you know, uh, and to let go, to hold experiences lightly. So, you know, people, uh, people come into, into our offices or onto our, our, our video calls, and they have had some incredibly, incredibly painful things happen to them. Sure. And to be able to learn how to hold experiences more lightly is truly a skill. It's truly a skill that we're not taught in schools. We're not taught growing up. It, it, it's truly a skill that, uh, that can help us hold pain in a more kind of dignified and with a little bit more space. So, so can we jump on that for a second, Chase? Yeah. So imagine I'm working with an indiv individual, uh, uh, well, lots of individuals who've had painful experiences. Yeah. They've had a lot of loss, uh, whether it's a physical injury, maybe a psychological injury, maybe you know, an assault, so something like that. And then they use chemicals to kind of numb themselves. So how would you use some of these ideas if someone's coming in, you say, okay, you've got a reservoir of pain over here yeah. and you're trying to keep that down by hitting the sauce or whatever it might be. 
Like what might, how might these three pillars show up in that consultation? Yeah, the first, the first thing I start with is making sure that the client and I, or the patient or whoever is aligned with what the goal is. Mm. And the goal is at first, if somebody's really been struggling with addiction, is this idea of creative hopelessness. It, that's, that's kind of a sad, dark sounding word. And, and Steve Hayes, who created it, who, cre who was the original founder of acceptance commitment therapy, said he wished he wouldn't have called it that because people don't understand it. Mm. But the idea is that um, all of the attempts to numb our experience uh, aren't gonna work uh, because they aren't gonna work. And just that if the analogy is quicksand, I use this analogy almost, almost weekly or daily, or I use it with almost all my new clients, is that if, if you're in quicksand and you go to, uh, you're up to your waist and you're like, uh oh, I need to get out of this quicksand, and you go to lift up one leg, uh, you're, the, the, the pressure on your left leg just doubled and now you're up to your belly. Yeah. And the more you struggle, the more you're sucked into that. Right. And that's addiction. That's why people eventually overdose and die. So that, do you know, how do you get out of quicksand? You first stop struggling. Yeah. And second, you can either, you can lay down and increase your contact with the quicksand. And the quicksand is your suffering. The quicksand is your emotional pain. The quicksand is the stuff that you don't want. But if you can actually be willing to contact it more, to feel it more and stop struggling with it, you eventually can roll out of that quicksand and into a life. Yeah. So that, especially when I have people come in, in for the first time, I, I don't know where they're at. Like they might be, they might have an idea that if, if they could just moderate their use a little bit, that's what they want to do. Some people know that they can't touch it again, you know, for the foreseeable future. So you really have to kind of use a little bit of clinical judgment, uh, to know where somebody's at in that journey. And then hopefully you can ask some questions that reveal that the struggle is not going to work like quicksand. Love that. Good. And this, this last pillar is get moving, do what matters most to us. That's rolling out of the quicksand. That's starting to build a life um, that, you know, you, you build even when you're feeling a lot of emotional distress. No, good. I like it. I think sometimes I also talk about this idea that sometimes it's the anticipation of negative feelings. It's, sometimes are worse than the feeling itself, right? Like we pay a lot of pre-tax on, you know, suffering. Uh, and, and just, just never happened. Yeah, that's never happened. So there's the, there's the suffering proper and then all the worry that comes before it. And that just kind of is, it's self-amplifying loop. Yeah. Like Jimi Hendrix, people loved him because he played the guitar right next to an amp and he made these crazy cool sounds and it was a self-amplifying loop. It's the exact same thing with, suffer with human suffering. Dude, I feel so much cooler that I did that. Can I just? <laughs> uh, so, here is a process model for psychopathology. It's a really fancy way of just saying, here's why we think people suffer, and it's it's not um, it's it's a process. It's a complex process. It's not just kind of a a box. So, you know, people regularly, myself included, disappear into an unchangeable past or an unknowable future. And my experience, that's a lot of where depression and anxiety live. When that happens, it's really hard to remember that anything matters. The question of what's the point, I mean, just dominates our awareness when we're no longer uh, able to kind of contact what matters deep in our hearts. Um, and then we, we just kind of mindlessly run from it. I mean, Ozarks, you guys, if, is it, if anyone's watched Ozarks, I mean, I just smashed through that series. It scared me. I mean, we are great at avoiding this stuff. Technology is really assisting us nicely. Um, and then the longer we do that, we start to develop a story about who we are. I'm a hypocrite. I'm lazy. I'm a loser. I'm a fraud. I mean, the longer we, we act um, in violation of our own values, I mean, it's very normal to have a story that says you're dot, dot, dot. Okay. And then, you know, our mind will generate another thought that says, you know what, you know, it'll make this go away real quick. Doesn't it? I'm thirsty. A beer sounds great. Uh, and then we have avoidance of experience. All right. Nice. So this kind of explains where suffering comes from in part. Yep. And then ACT also has some ideas on paths out. So if these are some of the pathways in, there's How do we get out? Way. Yeah. The hope. Where's the hope? It's been pretty dark. So now here's kind of what the, the other half of it is. So... An alternative to this endless suffering and misery 
the first step, if we just go around the same circle, is to be present. And a quick way I, I do that with clients is just take a sec. If, and I ask permission. It's all, I ask permission constantly throughout, throughout the session because maybe somebody's not in a place, and that's where am I and act nicely go together. But it's just, hey, take a second for a second and push. This is called dropping anchor. Take a second, just push your feet hard into the floor and take a second, push your hands together. If somebody I'm working with is really suffering, Brad, and I have them push their feet, push their hands together, start to become aware of the sounds in the room, and then catch that your mind is thinking right now, and it's okay, your mind can continue to think and just let that happen while you contact the present moment. I mean, whether or not you have five minutes or a whole therapy hour, that skill, instantly you can start practicing and if you can have a, a credible plan that really is, is small enough that you'll do it, not too big enough that you'll over, get overwhelmed, real change can happen like live. You can watch somebody become less hooked by their own thinking. I mean, like right yep. before your eyes. Yep. And that's what, when that happens, I don't feel burned up. Right. When that happens, like I feel pumped right. that I can see that somebody just stepped out of a little bit of suffering. And then they're like, Hey, let's, let's practice some more. You got some more of that kind of like drugs, like, Hey, that feels good, <laughs> Wait <a> you know, <laughs> but it's not going to kill you. Right. It's going to help you live a life. Right. Yeah. And these are things like even right now. So I know I've practiced some of these techniques that if I'm driving and I'm getting frustrated just to say, okay, I'm going to contact the steering wheel and I'm just going to really try to engage with what it feels like. Just the sensory kind of richness. And as that happens, when I get more con, you know, kind of contact with the present moment, my head slows down a bit, right? Like I get less ramped up, yeah. which again creates some of that psychological flexibility. And that's what we're going for. So today, like we could all try this. Like just what does it feel like, like your right foot right now? Or what does it feel like in your in your shoe? Or can you make contact with whether you're standing or sitting? Just find one point of physical contact and focus there for a moment. And then when you lose focus, say it's okay. You know, that happens, our brain ideas come in and they decay and that's just normal. Just go back to that kind of present moment, have that contact and then come back to, if you will, the conversation. And I think there is more flexibility, which really allows us to be more intentional and deliberate. So it's a great set of skills. And, and I think just after three weeks, if they scan your brain and you do five minutes of contact the present moment, your structures and your brain will change. And like, it, it's not just kind of a woo woo, like it, like there's some, there's some decent science behind it sure. that I'm, I'm deeply skeptical helps me kind of intellectually trust. And then emotionally when I actually practice it and it helps with suffering, I'm yeah. like, awesome. Great. So the other alternative is really just getting in touch with values. The tricky thing about talking about values in my experience is as soon as you do, the person is reminded about how long they've been not living in right. service of those values. And that's when you have to go back to a skill like be present. Yeah. And, and it's kind of a touch and go, you know, like if you, if I, as a person trying to help somebody change, stay on talking about values too long and I can see that they're hooked by a thought or a feeling I've got to be able to kind of stop. That's the process model. I'd be able to kind of stop, come back to another skill and then kind of come back to, uh, to a value. Kind of, kind of like random. Bike. One of the things I like about this is like, and I shared this in, in a previous podcast that sometimes we have these values like, oh, I want to give back to society. I'll do that when I retire. And I think I read this, I think it was Russ Harris's book or something like that, but I'll retire and then I will um, go help build schools in a foreign country. And it's like, no, that, that's fine. And today you can do something like I can say, you know, I can reach out and send a text to a family member, to a loved one and be kind right now. And so it's understanding what your values are and then realizing that we can bring, you know, our actions instantly, a, instantly to make those happen. Maybe not in its grand sense, but just stacking little, you know, actions on top of each other. Yes. Which that's the next part of the hex. This is called the hexaplex. That's the committed action piece. And, and I've made a lot of mistakes as a therapist where I can see somebody suffering and I want to help so badly, and I kind of inhabit the savior complex a little bit, that I start giving them way too many skills to practice. They get overwhelmed, and they come back and they say, oh, Chase, I didn't practice that skill. And it, and it took me like 
a lot of painful trial and error and feeling inadequate as a therapist as people weren't practicing the homework to break it down. How do you eat an elephant? I don't think we should eat elephants. <laughs> hypothetically one bite at a time. You've got to make it really tiny. And somebody that's walking out of an active addiction, it's got to be even smaller. Like all I could do to bring my, all I could bring myself to do some days was just to not create any more wreckage in my life was just to kind of sit on my hands. That is a very worthy committed action in early, early recovery. If, 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 if all that's you, if that's all you can do some days, sure. But my experience is my mind is like, that's not good enough. You should be doing all this stuff. Right, but right, it's right. like, Oh, there's my mind generating a thought. I politely decline the invitation to struggle with that thought. Yeah. And I'm going to get back to just sitting on my hands. Love it. And then, and then savoring those moments, like, like those small committed actions to savor those, to relish those, to do an affirmation. So in ors or from MI, this idea of affirming that I just did something right now. Like I dismissed, that shame voice or something like it may not be the whole elephant, but it's a little part that can kind of stack and develop. Amen. Uh, an amen. Nice. Dude, this is fun to talk about. This is great. Okay. So this is the trickiest one. This is a funky name. It says observing self. It's like, what is that? And, and all it is is pure awareness. We as human beings have a funky ability with consciousness and awareness that as far as we know, no other species have. And it's being able to use that awareness, whether or not it's awareness of the present moment, awareness of our values, awareness of committed action, awareness that we're thinking or awareness that we're feeling. That's what the acceptance and the diffusion parts are. We as human beings can more skillfully use our awareness so that we're not needlessly suffering or taking behaviors that take us away from our, our values. And the analogy is uh, notice, notice a you who is aware of being aware, we can be aware of being aware. And even that's just kind of a weird idea. Right. But the analogy is, this, is that, that painful thoughts and feelings are like a storm rolling in. Yeah. They're the, 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 the clouds and the thunder and the rain. And uh, the observing self is like the sky. There's a part of us as human beings that is unaffected by that storm. The sky is not fundamentally changed if the storm rolls in. It's okay. Like it can just... It has enough room for the storm to roll on and roll out. And if, and you can practice skills as human beings that, that instantly help you with that. Now, can I share a skill that I do there? Please. And again, this comes straight from ACT. So what I'll often do is I'll, I'll write down a piece of paper up and work on someone, A, B, and C. And in the C position, I'll have a thought such as, I can't do this. Like I can't, I was talking to them the other day, I can't go to sleep, or I can't get enough sleep or you know, I can't be successful in a relationship. And so that they'll write down C and then I'll have them rehearse that five times. And then in B, I'll write down, I am thinking. And then I'll have them write down, oh, excuse me, rehearse B plus C. I am thinking that if I don't get enough sleep, I'll ruin tomorrow. I am thinking if I don't get enough sleep, I'll ruin tomorrow. And then in that A position, humans think. And the thought that I tend to be having right now is that I'm thinking, that I'm not getting enough sleep and that'll wreck my day. Yeah. And then they rehearse that five times. And what most times happens is people get some of that psychological flexibility or that difference to say, wait a minute, I'm not fused with my thinking again. It gives me a little bit of space to renegotiate the power that I give some of these thoughts. And, yes. and that's very powerful. I find that very empowering. Amen. And, and like uh, in, a, in a, another just kind of very similar vein, if somebody has a story that seems so true, like, you know, like I was just saying, like, uh, I've been to rehab multiple times and it's very likely I'll go back. And, and pretty much nothing you can say can convince me otherwise. Like if, if somebody is kind of that dominated by their language, they may not be open to a skill, but if they are, one way you could say, would you like to learn how to have that language not beat you up so much and push you around? Are yeah. you interested in that? Yeah. And I'll have them do with me. Well, would you practice? Are you willing to practice the skill? Great. I want you to move your arm up and down. And I want you to say, I can't move my arm up and down. So if, if we just briefly do that, I can't move my arm up and down. 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 What is happening to how literally true I can't move my arm up and down? It seems silly, right? So it's like, how can we start? And it's not to make that thought go away, but it's to change the domination that it has over our awareness. And it's like, would you be interested in learning how to 
do that with some of your most painful experiences and yeah. stories that you have. Love because it. I, I, I can see that you're suffering. And if you have compassion first, and then you drop in some skills, people will change in the session with you. Yep. So there's diffusion, which is a fancy way to just say you unhook from a thought, we, which we just said. And instead of running from the feelings, instead of um, trying to make those feelings go away, accepting those feelings is a very misunderstood word. A lot of people think that acceptance means that they like it or want it. Right. Acceptance means that you are willing to receive mm -hmm. as a gift because it's already here. Our experience is already here and we are dropping the struggle with trying to make that painful emotion go away. Yeah. So can I, just an observation, Chase, yeah. and I'll be interested in what you think about this. So what's interesting is like some of these ideas are pretty heady. Like I think a lot of it hails back to some kind of Buddhist philosophy, yeah. which can be kind of difficult to access and wrap your brain around at times. And one of the wonderful things about ACT is I think you get some very concrete skills that you can do, like you said, in five minutes of you know, running someone through a little uh, kind of drill, if you will, yeah. and then checking in saying, you know, what's, the, what's your experience with that? So yeah. now it's not just a theoretical idea, it's an empirical idea and a subjectively Practical. experienced idea. Like, yeah. what's it like for you to do that? And then if you can even get two or three extra seconds, if you will, of flexibility, like that counts. And those, like I've worked with some people, like I was talking with a, a gentleman who was just at the verge of making a really bad decision yeah. that would have had dramatic impacts on his family. And to buy, you know, five seconds of saying, wait a minute, I think I can do this different. It Great made example. A, a world of difference, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, and then if we can stack that five seconds into 10, you know, 15, 20, 25, then you begin to change your life a bit. And that suffering can have a different relationship. It's so true. It's so true. And, and the thing that would stop me from practicing skills as a newer therapist, or even today sometimes, is the, the chance that we could practice the skill together and it actually not be useful. And, and me as a therapist, I know I only want to practice a skill with a client if it's going to be useful, but I can't perfectly control that. So me as the person trying to help change, I kind of have some willingness to be willing to do an experiment and possibly have a bad outcome quote unquote, bad outcome. But all it means is that that particular skill yep. isn't useful and there's tons, tons of other ones. Love it. So that's the ACT model. It's a six sided model. It's kind of like a box, uh, six sided of a box that they all interplay with each other as a process. It, and even process, like what does process mean? It, it, like, it's like a, like a procession, like at a, like at a parade. It's just a series of events. That's a very dynamic thing. You know, the ACT model may look complicated, and I can hear Steve Hayes saying the ACT model isn't complex, humans are. We are dealing with a very, very uh, challenging problem in changing human behavior. Yeah. And can I just share one more idea? I want to take over, but yeah. like that committed action again, like so sometimes I have issues with uh, initiating sleep. And by the way, we're going to bring you a podcast on sleep. Sweet. I've got, I've got someone who thinks a lot about that. So I take a lot of melatonin myself, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say there, Brad. But so this idea of like, I could sit and toss and turn or I could say, well, or I can get up and do something that's productive. Yeah. And so, you know, you're, and I, that directly comes from act. Like I can find a moment of choice or empowerment by saying, all right, I'm suffering here. I'm struggling. Well, I can make my life better because I've got all these things to do. Yeah. And when I do those, it just feels, you know, monumentally better than and taking committed action than not. So a lot of great skills. Thanks. I, 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 I'm just so happy to share like, and I, I know we have maybe 15 minutes and, and maybe just a quick sneak peek of, of future ACT trainings. This is kind of what you can, can expect that I, I really dive into kind of the philosophy and the theory and then I sprinkle skills throughout uh, so that it's not just kind of too heady. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to just take do it. two minute preview? Sure. So you can divide those six parts of the ACT model into three larger just groups. So, you know, with the name acceptance, there are acceptance and mindfulness processes, which you know is, is just about letting go. And uh, it's this side of the hexaplex. And then we have you know, the other parts here that I'm gonna group into the other one. So the first one is let go. The second one is uh, mindfulness and awareness processes. And that's just showing up to the present moment, especially when it's hard uh, and using our awareness wisely. Uh, for what is available to us and is useful. And the third set is 
the commitment and behavior change processes, which means like, all right, where are we going? Like, what do we want to do in really small ways that could really matter to you if you sustained them? Like, what kind of life do we want to create? And, and if you can have enough skills to put the mind on a leash to not interrupt that conversation or over time as you help people, like the conversations get awesome. And to see people change, like I get so fired up when people change, man. You seem like you believe this. <laughs> hey, let's do this. We've got a, a, some questions coming in, Chase. Okay. How about we stop here? And yeah. one of the things we've thought about doing just for the listening audience is um, developing a couple more hours of kind of training on the act and blending motivational interviewing and developing some skills that we will put on eSIM uh, that you could really kind of, if you will, unpack some of those skills and apply them with the people, whether it's students, people who are in probation, whatever it might be, so that you could kind of develop a few tools that can be useful right away. Does that sound agreeable? That sounds great. Hey, Brian, you're back on here. So um, moderate us through this. Yeah, so um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, first question we have is uh, for Chase. Is that a standard graphical representation of the ACT model or did you, um, did you create that on your own? It's, it's a, a combination from a few different sources. Uh, the, the actual like hexagon shape comes from one of Steve Hayes' uh, original slides. And then the, the let go, show up, get moving comes from more of the, it's called the ACT matrix. Um, but there's lots of different ways to describe the ACT model. And, and the ACT founders will actually say, hey, if, if you prefer to say a different word for acceptance, awesome. If you want a different word for just how you talk about uh, what the ACT model is, it's not super important that you have the specific wording right, but that you have the spirit uh, and the philosophy right. So they're flexible as well. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, we actually have a, a, a quiet uh, participants this week. We usually have more questions than we can field in, in 15 minutes, but um, that's, the, that's the only question I see, I see on here right now, unless anybody, anybody has anything. All right. Um, so we, just in the last few minutes, Chase, if you were to say you're working with someone that's like, you also supervise some other therapists that work for you. Yeah. And let's say they were to say like, hey, the client's coming in, you know, help me learn one or two act skills that I could use. I know that on some of what's maybe, I don't know if it's irresponsible or not, but if you were just to bust out like a five minute, like this is a skill that will probably work, how would you kind of explain it in terms of conceptualizing it and then delivering it? Pro yeah, great. And, and work with me on this. So. Great question. Yeah, so, so probably the first, the first skill to start with is informed consent. So the very first session, just use, if, if I'm the therapist and, you, and you're the client, is that we're in agreement that this is a type of uh, therapy or coaching or training that involves actively practicing pretty, uh, pretty different skills with some of the stuff that's hardest and most painful in your life. Are you open to doing that? Nice. Sure. So just this idea that there's some different kind of counseling approaches or you know, helping people, I just might listen to you and be a reflective listener. That's not this. It's not supportive counseling. Yeah. That's There's right. a place for that, but right. it's not this, this venue. Right. So just knowing like, if we're going to do act as one of our approaches, please know that you're, you're what you're signing up for, you're going to get a little bit of push to do something different regularly. If I have people that say, Hey, the, I'm trying to practice these skills and for myself, you know, if I haven't gotten sufficient permission, I'm gonna have a lot of extra friction in the session when I go to practice these skills. Uh, and, and just a couple of foundational ones that I usually rely upon or that I, that I offer to people is that creative hopelessness analogy and, and, and really kind of asking the client examples of how their attempts to make their unwanted painful experiences go away. Like Brad, if, 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 if you could just kind of help me understand what are some of the things that you've done to make anxiety go away? Me? Well, I'd say I, a couple. Uh, one is I try to do meditate or just relax. That doesn't usually work because my mind just kind of still spins on things. And then just kind of dealing with the problem, I think, is one of the, like, how do I respond to the issue, like name the issue and then try to get some movement on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and over time, if what that's doing is helping you live a life 
awesome. But if over time, if it's just further entangling you in your anxiety or in your addiction or in whatever you're struggling with, then would you be open to doing something radically different than that? Oh, sure. And if we just assume that the client comes to us and says, hey, what I'm doing isn't working and, and we ask for compassionate examples, not like, so like Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? He is just an arrogant, condescending person that I've observed. I, and I also, Dr. Phil, I, I know that you've helped a lot of people. Uh, that was a little, that was a little aggressive on my part. I just wouldn't personally do that. It's just a very, it's a very equal playing field. I guess that's the other thing I'd share, Brad, is that it's like two, the analogy is that there's two mountains that the, the, the client and me as the therapist, we're each climbing our own mountains. I have a vantage point that I can see stuff that they can't. It's like mm -hmm. right above you, there's some stuff to be on the lookout for. I can't control what you do, but are you open to talking about it? And then the client can see things that like, um, Chase, we, we practiced that skill, but it actually wasn't very useful. And if we can kind of collaboratively help point that out and practice skills together, that's another just kind of fundamental stance that's super important. Nice. I like so. it. Hey, guys. Um, I have another question. This one's from uh, Phil McGraw. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> you think that this, um, that this type of therapy works with teenagers as well? You know, I personally do not work with teenagers. And I don't know a ton of the research about how ACT works with, with adolescents. Yeah, so I, I do work with teenagers occasionally. And I think these principles are pretty universal. I know anytime you say that, you're going to get some pushback. Yeah. But if people have the ability to do some, a little bit of abstract, abstract reasoning and they're willing to lean into some different experiences, I definitely think it, it works. I worked with a 16-year-old person last week. And it was experiencing, we had an earthquake. We were broadcasting from Utah here. We had a pretty big earthquake about a month ago and then the pandemic. And so, you know, there's a lot of kind of concern and fear, especially for, a, if you will, a younger mind. And to just kind of go through some of these actions, like, you know, figuring out what the values are. Yeah. To say like, oh, I really care about my family. I'd hate to lose my family. So, okay, we can't control that. But what can you control? Well, I can control being kind. I can control how I show up in my family. I can control some of my actions. Taking 10 seconds before I respond. Yep, exactly. And so as she went through some of that, it's like, oh, you know, I did, if you will, wrestle a little bit of a sense of control or empowerment in what seems to be something that you can control, pandemics and earthquakes. And so I think it definitely works as long as, you know, the, the individual has enough wherewithal to engage in some abstract or formal reasoning. Yeah. And, and then we just have to kind of bring it down to their, uh, to their level of understanding, not bring it down, like match their level of understanding. I, I'll, I'll just share anecdotally, I've worked with a handful of, you know, late adolescents and the stance of act that we're, we're kind of two equals here works awesome. It's just not a, not a, a, a niche or a population that I've, I've spent a lot of time with, but, if, if I take that stance into the therapy room with a teenager, my experience has been really positive. Yeah. Guys, would you guys recommend any one book for ACT therapy? Uh, Brad already mentioned Russ Harris. He has a second edition of ACT Made Simple that is fantastic. He also has a series of online courses. Uh, there's ACT for Anxiety, ACT for Depressions, ACT for uh, Adolescents. I actually just combined adolescence with depression. That was, that was strange. Depression and adolescence, there's one for trauma. I should be getting a royalties for Russ right now because I'm pitching. But the trainings, you guys, the lawsuit they're also Dr. discounted. Gonna bring you and I'm going to be able to, yeah, I'm going to be in, in the poor house. But they're also discounted. They're 50% off of COVID. So if you want to learn more about ACT specifically, um, that's another great option. I like the happiness trap. I think it's great uh, by Russ Harris as well. I think it kind of hits some of the main points and is really accessible for all audiences, I, I think it's it's great. It, it takes a bit, like it is a shift, right? Like, and so that's where I think sometimes having a coach to help you along with it can be helpful. Yeah. This is a different way of, of viewing the world. I was pretty intimidated when I started to learn about acceptance and commitment therapy. And it took me probably a year before I felt like I could explain it at a dinner party normally. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex, complex model. Okay. Um, just now we're starting, the questions are, are starting to come in a little bit. We're, I know we're running out of time. 
but um, can you describe a case where you worked with a client with addiction issues and was also chronically mentally ill? Yeah, so, so my, my very first internship was at a, a place that's no longer uh, open with uh, veterans who are experiencing homelessness. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of what you just described, Brian, like, and I didn't know much about, uh, I knew a little bit about ACT when I first started that, that internship. But I almost, those, those men taught me more about how to apply what I just learned in school than, than you know, school could have kind of ever, ever taught me. And, and I guess as I, as I reflect back on that, that, that it's, if you have an addiction history and severe mental health issues, it's that much more important that the person you're working with to help you change your life views you as an equal views you as someone who has access to a lot of wisdom and a lot of values and uh, that your experience can be drawn, drawn upon that it's not your enemy. And it's, I think in those populations that are more vulnerable, um, it's, it's that much more important. And as far as research, I'd, I'd have to get back to you about what research says. Yeah, so let me, if I can fill that one, Brian. So I was working on someone recently that just came out of an IOP for addiction related issues and talked about being in between like a parent and the spouse and feeling like, oh, like they're both like, you know, they, they came to visit, some things went wrong. And she's talking about like, that's the time I would have drank, right? Like the stress got pretty high. It would be easy to escape and just yeah. say, screw it. I'm going to go get, you know, a little bit numbed out here. And then to say, okay, let's go through and talk about this idea of acceptance commitment therapy. Here's one thing you can do to help. And then just using some of those principles, whether it's the kind of the stepping back, committed action, looking at your values, and, and coming up with a, you know, a very specific game plan to say, okay, here's what you did well, like celebrating that. Here's where ACT would support some of your actions. And here's a few other techniques about you know, managing the stress so that you're not as, if you will, vulnerable. triggered or yeah. vulnerable to, to relapse. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'll say is that I, I'm familiar with ACT compared to treatment as usual in just traditional treatment settings. And it has outperformed treatment as usual in addiction treatment centers. I don't know if that addiction treatment center also include like severely or persistently mentally ill, but often at the comorbidity with active addiction and really chronic health, mental health problems is, is very, very common. So I actually would say that research supports uh, with com comorbid conditions. What about in a, in a group setting? Would you use it in, in that type of setting? Absolutely. One of the analogies is, uh, it's called passengers on a bus, or the metaphors of active, and the analogy is, or the metaphor is, uh, that if you're driving uh, in the direction of your values and you start to turn towards something that you really care about, all these passengers on the bus will start to voice why that's a bad idea, why you're gonna fail, uh, you know, all the painful thoughts and feelings, and you can do that with the group. So the group could, you could model what their minds say about that value direction and like, it can be really, really cool when you do experientially uh, some of those metaphors. It can really change because I, I, as a person who's been to addiction treatment as a client, I've sat through I don't know how many groups and so many of them were so repetitive and so painful. And bringing a metaphor like that can be super, super fun and super meaningful. There's room for improvement. Yeah. Nice. I think we're about at our time, Brian. Or what, what would no, that's it. You did mention the books were 50% off somewhere. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, the trainings for, for, with Russ Harris, the last I checked, they were 50% off. Oh, and okay. the Harbinger, which publishes a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy materials, have also had some really heavy discounts. So it's a, it's a great time if you want to learn more. Great. All right. Well, let me, um, we'll just kind of wrap up here, guys. We got a bunch of slides, but oh, I'm going to miss that. Thank you. I will. Um, Hey, let me do this. Brian, do you have any last minute information? No, that's it. So um, I messaged everybody with uh, where you could find the webinar slides, CEU certificate, and uh, recording. We're, we're going to have that up this afternoon. And then we emailing it out to everybody in the next 24 and 72 hours as well to let you know or serve as a reminder as to where you can, you can get that stuff. 
So um, oh. info.com forward slash webinars, pretty straightforward and simple, but I'll send that out as well. Oh. Chase, I want to say thanks. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. I love your passion thanks, and man. your commitment and your authenticity. And uh, I, I greatly appreciate your wisdom here. Thanks, guys. So much fun. Thanks for the invite. Thanks. Thanks. You guys there?